Hello and welcome to episode 6 of the Comic Book Showcase. My name is Jamie Har, I'm founder of the Marvel and DC Databases, and I'm joined, as always, by the irrepressible Rab, the wonderful Mike, and the very knowledgeable Alana. And we're going to talk today a little bit about good guys gone bad and the vice versa, bad guys gone good. And we're going to start by talking about a very recent reference in uh, the cinematic universe, which is uh, something that surprised a few people, the Winter Soldier. Um, we, you know, in the, in the movie, he was... Um, referenced as being Bucky in the past, but Bucky no more, and how uh, he was really the villain of the movie, but we all know what, uh, at least in the comic book universe, how that changes and, and, and some of the reasons behind that. So just uh, without any further ado, I'm going to jump right in and ask, um, what, um, what sort of impact does this sort of character uh, morality, sense of uh, stable uh, morality change have on the character their friends and family, and then on us as, a, as an audience. Uh, Rob, why don't you tell us uh, what you think about that? Well, it makes me think of Hal Jordan specifically because he's a really big case where a good guy went bad, and that happened in the Emerald Twilight storyline when he tried to remake Coast City with his ring, and the Guardians were like, you can't do that. So he became very angry with them and decided that he would murder all of them. And in the process of murdering all of them, he drew the ire of a great deal of people. And the upshot of that and Zero Hour, with best buddy Green Arrow had to shoot him to death with an arrow, um, and he died. In terms of the character, it sort of made Hal Jordan dissipate, and it really... It, it revived his book to some extent because we got a new Green Lantern in Kyle Rayner and uh, that went very well. In my opinion, I was a big fan of Kyle Rayner. Um, but Hal Jordan himself, until much later, was dead as a character. And so, did, just out of curiosity, did it change your opinion of the character uh, for the history before he went bad? Like, you, you obviously had formed an opinion on him in the years prior. Did, did that in any way change the way you feel about his actions prior? Well, it was kind of weird. I mean, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Hal before. I mean, I, I knew about Hal Jordan and I was reading him, but I felt like his book was kind of dull and all of the interest was in the, the Green Lantern core. His death sort of was, or his death and his going bad was sort of, it draws you back to the character to some extent because you're like, this is kind of dull, but oh, now he's bad. This is exciting. Some, his dr drama, drama's happening. And so in the end, you would say that he had to die as a penance for his sins kind of thing? I Is wouldn't it, be so cruel as to say that, but I, I think that's how I think that's how they felt, uh, uh, DC, or at least that's how the characters felt. It, it was necessary for Hal to die after the events of Zero Hour, which were much, pretty awful as well, in comparison to just murdering all of the Green Lanterns. So, from a Marvel perspective, Atlanta, obviously one of the big examples, uh, Jean Grey and the whole Dark Phoenix saga. Uh, what? How do you like? Did that differ in any way, or what were sort of the repercussions and sort of the the impact on the characters and the audience there? What do you think? Well, it's a similar situation, although much earlier to what happened to Hal Jordan, um, where uh, Jean Grey, one of the staple main characters of the Marvel universe, uh, in the early '80s, um, went bad, got a whole bunch of power, could you know do a whole bunch of stuff she couldn't do before. Uh, and part of going bad meant killing a whole bunch of people, uh, blowing up uh, inhabited planets in her case. And uh, the way that the story was going to be resolved, uh, based on what was written, uh, was that she was going to get depowered um, and stay that way for a, a long time as a, a sort of her penance. She didn't get to have powers and be an X-Man anymore. Um, but the editorial staff at Marvel at the time thought that uh, that was not enough and that the character had to die as penance uh, for killing all those people. The, the idea that she can't be a hero and she can't just walk away uh, with as little consequence as not having powers anymore. 
But I'm curious, though, if the editorial staff actually had maybe some inkling of that uh, that eventual plan in their mind from the beginning. I mean, obviously, it was. Uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong. If it was actually named the Phoenix Saga from the beginning, and so you know the the main concept of the Phoenix is rising from the ashes, from death, and to rise again. So I wonder if uh, there was some plan to do that, either with her powers or with her altogether, somewhat from the beginning. Well, that's probably what the writer had intended, that, uh, you know, after being depowered for a long time and everything, she would, you know, rise uh, from everything that had happened. But uh, from what I've read, and this was years ago um, that I read this, and I think it was the Untold Story of uh, the Phoenix, or a book, something like that, it was released, I think, in the mid-late 90s, maybe? Um, that the, it, it came as a... The, the, the editorial staff did not know how the story was going to end until a couple of months before the issue was, was going out. And uh, everything was already written, or everything was already drawn, or mostly drawn for the issue before um, it was a, whoa, 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 whoa. No, that's not how it can end. Wow, that, that's actually quite interesting. Um, okay, so um, in general, do we feel that these sorts of uh, black-white on-off switch uh, switches in, in the characters... Um, do we sense that that's more of a uh, character derailment, like just taking the initial intent of a character and throwing it off the tracks, or is it uh, potentially a, a natural progression that, that is actually a valid storytelling point, or is there some uh, mid-ground to be had? Uh, anyone want to chime in on that? Well, I think it's a natural character progression that uh, eventually should be told by a lot of people. Um, like, we're all inherently both good and evil, and it's, I mean, it can go either way, especially when you're dealing with people who wield such power, they're eventually going to either snap or figure out that, you know, one way of doing things isn't necessarily the way it's going to work, and it has to be done another way, and I guess that's kind of the case in Hal Jordan, where he had the idea of what he thought was the correct way of doing things. The Guardians clearly thought, no, you're doing it the wrong way, and there was a conflict that arose, and thus drove him into being evil. Um, it's like, I guess a good example is the Crime Prime Syndicate from uh, the Alternate yeah. Earths in the DC Universe, where it shows um, a lot of the same heroes in a negative light, and they're all criminals instead of being superheroes. So it kind of shows how cho choosing to take things in a different direction um, in that same, like, kind of similar character power set, um, it's, you know, it could be so easily done. It's uh, just a natural progression. That's a good point. Um, Rab, actually, you and I were talking a bit earlier about uh, you had some thoughts. I think I think and Atlanta just mentioned it, Cassandra Cain. You thought that that was actually a bit of a derailment in that case, as opposed to a character progression. Is that is that what you were trying to get at earlier? Well, I think it's like you said in a statement previously made a few seconds ago uh, that it's it can be a derailment or it can be a natural progression. It's not one or the other. I mean, it is one or the other, but it's not. This whole concept is not one or the other. I think Cassandra Kane's conversion from good to bad was a derailment. I think, like you said earlier, it can be an instance of a, a derailment or a natural progression, and in her case, I think it was not a natural progression. I think it depends on the writer and the, the mechanism the writer uses to make that switch, like the heel face turn, you have to have, or the face heel turn, I guess, in this case, you have to have a good reason, and I think in her case it was a not a great reason. I'm not even, I can't even really remember what the reason was. It was something to do with her father dying or something like that. This is, a, I, I'm a bad rememberer, but the point was that the experience of reading the character sort of makes you turn against her because you don't believe the way that she's changed. Like, you could get behind a character who has gone bad or good if they've, if they've done it for the right reasons in your mind, but if it feels forced in some way, you, you turn against them, and you turn against the writer, and you turn against the company, and you get mad.
Well, I mean, some are almost like scapegoats in that they are turned to a bad character, yeah. and it's like sometimes just plot driven. Um, I like sometimes I'm conflicted about the way that uh, Maxwell Lord was kind of um, like. I never really saw him as a good guy, but I never really saw him as the bad guy that needed to be killed by Wonder Woman in the way that he was. So it's like, where did that, like, was that a natural progression? Was so you, that... you actually bring up a really good point, and, and I think it, just to sort of take a slight tangent on that is the, the concept of choice versus no choice. So in the, the examples of Dark Phoenix, where she was somewhat possessed by, a, you know, otherworldly power... Uh, Archangel, uh, the original instance where he kind of flipped from good to bad, uh, again, uh, under the influence of Apocalypse, etc., etc. Um, so do we have much feeling in terms of, how, if are you more willing to forgive a character if they're obviously brainwashed into turning bad to good? And, and how does that impact the consequences? Like, if they go from bad to good under the influence, we'll call it, um, are they then free of any consequence or ramifications to their character when they're not brainwashed anymore? Is everyone just like, oh, so, no worries, you were brainwashed, it's cool. Well, I guess it kind of depends on, like, the actions that they took while they were uh, under the influence. In Archangel's case, there's a lot of people that kind of held a grudge against what he did, like, inside the comic books. Um, but readers kind of, I guess, would sympathize with him because, you know, there was a lot of stuff that happened to him during that time, and... You know, like, what What are you supposed to feel? Like, what is the writer making you feel about these characters? Um, some cases it can be really cool and interesting, such as um, let's, Flashpoint, for example. You had Aquaman and Wonder Woman in not necessarily bad characters, but it was they were being who they are, uh, like the king of the seas and, like, queen of the Amazons, defending chunks of land or claiming sections of the world for themselves in a dictatorship type style fighting amongst themselves in the fashion that like works for their power sets and works for their like their people in a way that's not mainstream for the regular universe and that played out really well and you didn't really feel those sympathies towards them because they were being like such I don't know evil versions of themselves. So in the DC universe, uh, going back probably 15, 20 years, there was a story uh, in the Red... It was a series called Red Sun, and it told the story of uh, Superman, what would have happened if he had landed in the USSR. And uh, there was a number of ramifications, including Lex Luthor being a bit of a good guy, uh, if you can imagine that. And it was very akin to a what-if in the Marvel universe... Uh, Atlanta, obviously, there's been a lot of what-ifs that have uh, changed the nature of characters and given extra limbs or, or you know, had them join different teams, but obviously we're talking about bad guys gone good and good guys gone bad. Uh, do you have any examples from the Marvel What If series, Atlanta? The number one example, and this there's so many examples of it from the, the classic what-ifs from the, the 80s, is Reed Richards. Uh, anytime something happens to Sue, Reed Richards goes bad. He, uh, or, or Sue dies. Richards goes bad. Sue and one of the kids die. Richards goes bad. Sue runs off with Namor. Richards goes bad. Also, he's crazy. Dr. Doom is the good guy. That means Richards is bad because Sue's run off with, with Dr. Doom. Like, it's just, <laughs> no matter, no, if anything happens to Sue, Richards goes evil. And that really, it, it's a little bit different than than, uh, than some of the other examples we've talked about, because this is an insight into that character. What's keeping Reed Richards from being some kind of supervillain, uh, akin to Doctor Doom? It's well, a it's, loose thread. It's Sue being there. Yeah. We're talking about Reed Richards and how he depends on Sue reminded me of Injustice Gods Among Us, which is... There's a comic series based on the video game, but it's a video game where the idea is that there's this alternate universe where Superman goes bad because the Joker kills Lois Lane, and he goes bad in the not like the not really bad way, like in the way where 
he wants to so protect everybody that it turns into a horrible dictatorship, which is sort of similar to Red Sun, but in a different way. But And it's... You get kind of sick of it, actually. You get kind of sick of seeing Superman as a dictator because what do you do with an all-powerful dictator? I guess that's the plot of Injustice Gods Among Us. It, it, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't that go back to a bit of our earlier point? Was, was it Injustice Gods Among Us where uh, we see Lex Luthor plunge a kryptonite spear into Superman's back? Yeah, I think that was DC Universe Online. Oh, that gives me. It was sort of the the same the same sort of premise, though, wasn't it? That um, you know, Superman kind of gives up on the rules, and and it's what we'll call total war, where you know, killing is acceptable, and everything was uh, you know on the table. All the cards were on the table. Every, you know, Superman killing people in order to achieve the greater good. Um, you know, isn't it's not quite good guys gone bad, but it's the shedding of that sort of moral and ethical, you know, boundary, um, and, you know, you know, if we talk about um, the limits of a good guy versus a bad guy, you know, in classical comics it's very black and white, but in reality it's more shades of gray, and I would say that when you slide a, a character down the, the, the scale, um, the, it's really a continuum, and as you slide them down the scale, they don't necessarily need to go all the way to bad before they start having repercussions or start being perceived differently. Like, I, I guess another example is in the Marvel Universe, Cyclops recently, and sort of his actions, um, he's still considered to be a good guy, but there's a lot of people he's really cheesed off with uh, his actions, and, uh, you know, I think there's an outcome he's trying to achieve uh, for the greater good of mutant kind, and you know, as he slides down this slippery slope of of morality and and ethics, um, you know, we see the consequences and we see the personality change, and we potentially could eventually see Cyclops flip to the bad side if if he cracks just a little bit more and then just becomes, you know, a, a true bad guy in this classic sense of the term. Well, I mean, in that case, you kind of have to feel a little bit for the guy because he's slowly seen his entire race dwindle to the point where there's, like, you're, you're almost at extinction. And he's really just trying to hold on to that, um, you know, that vision that they originally had, but he kind of sees himself moving towards a more Magneto-style uh, ideolo ideology rather than the Xavier one because, it, like really, the old Xavier ideology doesn't work anymore in the situation that they're in. They're really being pushed to the brink, and, you know, I, like, it's kind of understandable if he flips over that line to do some of that bad guy stuff in order to make, uh, you know, ends meet. That reminds me of Black Adam. Agreed. That reminds me of Black Adam, too, where in the 52 book he had uh, he had fairly recently become a, a good guy from being a just a generic bad guy with no real depth uh, to the to sort of understanding why he was uh, uh, he, he was a complex character um, the idea of this guy being brought forward different morality but still fighting alongside the justice society until he takes over uh, Kandak and um, is, makes his the country that he's taken over a wonderful place for the people to live, um, bringing peace, uh, destroying corruption, and then um, and then his wife gets murdered and supervillains all over the place, and he 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 loses it and uh, starts that whole World War Three storyline. But that was a, a that was a natural sort of progression as well with the character, um, where he had a morality that was understandable and was uh, was spelled out fairly specifically uh, in the Justice Society books, and uh, his uh, his descent back again into into looking like just a, a terrible evil person where he's killing superheroes and killing soldiers and destroying the country beside him. Uh, it's, it's understandable. You, you see where it's coming from. 
So do we do we generally feel that this continuum of good to bad and everything in between is a constantly sliding scale? Like if a number of consequence or sorry, if a number of um, you know situations and, and milestones arose in Black Adam's life again, which pushed him toward good, he would eventually tip like a teeter totter, and now he's good again and trying to rebuild his life. Or is this sort of do we look at this as sort of uh, more permanent changes in the characters? Is that the, the general intent, or how do we feel? I think you erode some of the fandom's good faith when you do that too often. Like, you 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 start to feel like this person's wishy-washy. They don't hold on to their values. <laughs> but it's you want your you want your characters to be more pure. I think like you want your good characters to remain good as you're reading them. You don't ever really want them to go bad. It's when they do go bad that you're sort of won over by them going bad, maybe, or you're just an eternally angry about it. But uh, the, when bad goes good, they can win you over in that way because you want them to go good. Like, there's this thing inside us that wants everyone to be good, generally, I think. So there's more of a chance for a character who's bad, who goes good, to stay good and keep our attention and our happiness than there is for the other way around. Yeah, and I think that using some of these alternate universe or what-if uh, storylines really help um, give the writers the ability to uh, take some characters and flip them back and forth through good and evil. Um, like, one of my favorite ones most recently was... Uh, seeing that the death of Bruce drove his father to become the Batman and actually had his mother become the Joker in an alternate storyline. And that is a concept that I'd love to see played out a little bit more of to see how that dynamic works. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think that's a, I think that's a natural place to end so we'll break for here for episode 6 thank you very much to everyone for joining us Mike, uh, Rab, and Elena as always a pleasure and we look forward to talking to everybody next week in episode 7, thanks so much and that's a wrap for another episode of the Comic Book Showcase join us again live via chat or Twitter next week like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter and to learn more about today's topics check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere.